Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first colloquium of the semester. Uh, this week we have with us Ramandeep Gill. Uh, uh, so Ramandeep got his PhD uh, in astrophysics from the University of British Columbia uh, under Jeremy Hull. His thesis was on astrophysical plasmas around compact objects. He has held postdoctoral fellowships at CETA uh, in Toronto, the Open University of Israel, and George Washington University, uh, and he's been at ARIA since 2022. Uh, he's an expert on relativistic jets and GRBs. Uh, he uses semi-analytical techniques and numerical simulations to uh, calculate the outflow dynamics like the spectrum and polarization of high energy transients. Um, he is, uh, is at ARIA, he is in charge of the colloquium, and he also uh, organizes monthly collaborative meetings, uh, seminars between uh, IRIA and institutes in Taiwan. So. Thanks, Amanda. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you all for joining me here. So uh, today in this talk, I would like to share some exciting new observations and the uh, theoretical modeling of those observations that we've done and the new results that we've obtained, which are providing valuable insights into the um, your, the, the angular structure of, of the GRB jets, therefore the jets power these uh, gamma ray bursts, and of also the magnetic field structures that we have in these jets. So the, the content of this talk is derived from these uh, four recent works from last year and this year. Uh, so I have this challenge of presenting all that in just the next 45 minutes. Uh, but I'll, I'll stick to the same points, and uh, if you are interested, you can go check out these works online. Um, so let me now start with a brief uh, let's see, let's change the slides, brief introduction so that all of us are on the same page and, and uh, some terms I will drop here and there so that you know what I'm talking about. So first of all, uh, for what are GRBs? These are bright cosmic transients, the brightest that we have uh, in our universe. Uh, they appear as bright bursts, as we, bright bursts, as the name suggests, uh, uh, of, of gamma rays. Uh, they're extremely luminous, um, lasting anywhere between 0.1 seconds to 100 seconds. These are the typical time scales, but there is a large distribution. They can also go below this time and even to hundreds of seconds sometimes. And over this duration, they are releasing an enormous amount of energy, uh, which is quite high. So here the distribution of, uh, as a, of all the energy that is released. Uh, and the peak is around 10 to the 53 Earths. So this is like the property equivalent energy. Um, and since they are so bright, we can see these objects to very large distances, okay, to vast regions of the universe. Uh, here, the distribution of the redshift, and you can see it peaks at around a uh, redshift of two. That's where most of the zeros are coming from. And there's the reason why, because most of the stars are forming at that redshift. But then it, it goes all the way up to the record breaking red, red, uh, redshift of 9.4. Okay. And because they are, can be seen to such large distances, naturally their distribution over the sky is highly isotropic. So this is the data set collected by BATSI, which was an instrument on this uh, Compton Gamma Observatory back in the day and uh, collected a lot, data on a lot of these GRBs and it is highly uh, isotropic, which also settled the debate at that point, at that time, whether GRBs were galactic or cosmological in media. Um, so, so what produces these uh, these bright flashes of gamma rays? Well, uh, there are many open questions that we're still trying to resolve, but there's one undeniable fact that gamma ray bursts are produced by uh, fast moving ultra relativistic jets. Okay, so the material that is emitting these these bursts must be moving at bulk tolerance factors of, of see which button to press on this uh, of, of hundred. Which you know, amounts to, if you go, you go back to your special relativity, is if the stuff is moving at 0.99995 times the speed of light. Okay. So it's moving almost at the speed of light. These are bipolar outflows that are launched by very rapidly spinning compact objects. Most likely it is a black hole because we know how black holes launch uh, such relative strict flows, ADNs, and we have various other examples. Uh, but some do believe that these could also be uh, millisecond magnetars. These are these are strongly magnetized neutron stars, uh, spinning, also spinning rapidly. And there is some evidence that might support the existence of, of these as the, the compact sources that are powering these jets. So as the, as the jet is launched, uh, it breaks out of this consigning medium. In this case, it's the star. Uh, expands away to very large distances, so at about, uh, about an astrono astronomical unit or so. Uh, it undergoes this internal dissipation, whether due to shocks, if this 
uh, this thing is lodging multiple shells, or if it's a magnetic flow, then you can have magnetic connection or other MHD type of instabilities that produces the gamma rays. But the fireworks don't end there, it continues on. This relative, relativistic ejecta continues to plow through the surrounding external medium. Uh, and because it was moving at such fast velocity, it shocks the medium and produces this, you know, a non thermal shock emission, which we see as this broadband uh, afterglow. So I, I just this term afterglow a lot because the whole talk is focused on that. Uh, and we see this emission uh, over multi wavelengths. Okay, so this is a very very beautiful, uh, beautifully sampled GRB. Uh, where okay, so it's so like. Make, make a small point. So in contrast to the prompt emission, which is very short-lived, three or four tenths of seconds, the afterglow goes, goes on and on over weeks, months, and years uh, time scale. So this presents us a, a good tool to understand the, the dynamics of the jet, the energetics of the flow, which we may not be able to do in such a sh uh, short time over the prompt emission. So the emission is broadband. You see it over uh, different uh, energy scales, all the way from radio, optical emission, X-rays, uh, gamma rays, okay, and also in this particular case, this was the first year where we detected TEV emissions. So we have TEV emissions detected by magnet fields. So, so I want to make this. Uh, this is an important point I want to make here, which is um, that GRBs are produced by two different progenitors. Uh, one of those are massive stars. So uh, uh, these are massive uh, wolf ray stars that, that undergo core collapse. And launch these jets, uh, produce a compact remnant and, and launch the jets. Uh, the other variety, the other, other class uh, of sources, is the, uh, the the binary merger of two two compact sources. Uh, example, for example, neutron star, neutron star, or it could be a neutron star black hole, but not a black hole black hole because you don't expect any 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 sort of emission from those. Um, and this sort of bimodality in term, in the in the two classes is apparent when you look at the duration distribution of the prompt which is the bright flash that you see uh, earlier on. And you see these two humps and most of the, most of the short GRBs are, are for you know, less than two seconds or for tenth of a second. And most of the long GRBs are much longer duration, even going up to hundreds of seconds. Okay. But the point that, I want, that is of interest to this talk is that the density distribution outside it of the external medium uh, around these compact objects in which the jet has to propagate through is, can be different. So for example, these are old remnants, so would you expect the density distribution to be just ISM, okay? No radial dependence. Uh, you, know, you know, these things happen in rather pristine environments. However, for the long duration GRBs, which I'll be mostly talking about today, um, because these are wolf ray stars and they do uh, have these uh, strong stellar winds, they pollute the env outside environment and do embed this density distribution, uh, mm -hmm. like a wind. So which goes and are the minus two. So in general, when we try to understand observations and, and do theoretical modeling of those observations, we uh, take a general approach and uh, assume that the external density goes as R to the minus K, where K can be anywhere between zero and two. Zero is the ISM case and two, uh, the wind scenario. Okay. And these things become important in the modeling because they do affect the dynamic of the flow. They do affect the emission that you see. So in terms of the energies yes. distribution is also this by by modality. So the yeah, so the energy distribution, so there was a plot actually. If I quickly go back, there is some uh, if I go back rather quickly. Uh, we don't have many short GRB events, but you see that it's hard to tell these are like select few events. So it is uh, on the on the shortest shorter end. Okay. Uh, these, because we see most of most of the events we see are long GRBs, so we have good data, and then they are not very much more energetic. But the old, one difference which I didn't talk about is the emission that we see from short GRBs is harder. So the peak of the emission, uh, the spectrum, is at higher energies compared to the long GRBs. There is that bimodality there as well. Uh, oh, can I ask a brief question too? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah, I I don't understand uh, if if the gamma if the bursts are produced by sudden events like the merger of uh, neutron stars or something. Why do you need to have the jet in the first place? Uh, yeah, in fact, the jet seems to me like a long-lived uh, phenomenon. 
uh, but the, the bursts are bursty, so it seemed they, they seem to be more related to uh, to sudden events rather than like like a st stationary structure like a jet. No, uh, I'm so a little bit confused. Yeah, good question. Let me clarify. I wasn't clear enough. I guess uh, the 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 burst the, the initial burst that you see, which I call prompt emission, that occurs actually in the jet. Okay, it is the jet. This is happening at one, almost one astronomical uh, unit away. Okay, this is at 10 to the 12, 10 to the 14 centimeters away from where it was launched. So it is not the merger itself that gives you the burst. It is the jet, the dissipation uh, happening in the jet, whether due to shocks or whether due to some energy instabilities that produces the gamma rays. So does that answer your question? Uh but, uh, and then, but how is the jet related to the sudden event of the, the merger or whatever? So the merger, okay, so the, when you have binary mergers, the, the only thing that you see, uh, the emission is basically the, the gravitational waves, okay? And you see this chirp signal uh, that we detect from some of these merging events. That's yeah. the only thing, like there is no, uh, at that point, no EM emission, no electromagnetic emission. The electromagnetic emission mm -hmm. comes much later on when the jet expands to large distances away and undergoes some sort of dissipation. <laughs> so there's always but, a, there, there's actually a you know, the one event that we actually did detect, there is a delay of, uh, I think it was about 1.7 1, 1. seconds or something, uh, which tells you that the emission is not coming from the same place where, you know, where, the, where the gravitational waves were, were launched. I see. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Okay. But so, so if the jet is long lived, why yeah. is, is, why do we see bursts? So, Okay, uh, let me see. This is what I, so the, the initial burst, which I'm talking about, the prompt emission is this part, the short lived burst of gamma rays. And then there's a long lived emission, which is this long tail here, which is coming from the shock ejector, shock, shock the external medium. Mm, okay. this, and this is happening at almost about 10th of a parsec or, or somewhere in that 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 centimeters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Sure, thanks very much. Um, okay, so let me give you a, a quick overview of how we think about these uh, shock emission and, and, and model the afterglow emission. So, okay, so the theory for the, for the afterglow shocks, afterglow emission is based on a well-known uh, theory for spherical adiabatic blast waves, okay, which was first studied in this uh, seminal paper by Bradford and McKee, 1976 applies to all of the places where you have ultra relativistic uh, blast waves going through external media. And then people realize that, well, you know, if you have fast moving ejecta in, in GRBs, then that must also apply here. So let's, you know, they use that model uh, to understand uh, what the emission. And this is, sort of, this is the it's sort of classic picture that came out of uh, many of these seminal works that are important for the, for the GRB physics. Uh, so consider, um, Consider a baryonic shell, a mass shell moving at very large Lorentz factors. Okay, so this bit, you know, this shows the sort of density distribution. There are four different regions, and why are there four different regions? Because as the shell continues to plow through the ejecta, it is slowed down by by the the mass that is it is collecting. It acts, it acts like a snow plow, and then two shocks develop. One is the forward shock, which propagates ahead of the fast moving ejecta and shock heats all the collected, you know, the swept up external medium, okay? So external medium, in this case, like it's the ISM, the cold medium. It gets shocked, becomes, uh, you know, all the kinetic energy from the shell is converted into uh, to, to heat, thermal energy. And another reverse shock goes back into, because that information of that ejecta has to slow down, has to be communicated to the material in riding along in the shell, okay? So there's a, there's a shock going backwards, uh, backwards into the ejecta. So that's why we have these four regions. Um, and what we want to do, do is understand the properties of what's going on here, because this is where the emission is coming from, from the hot seat. <laughs> so how do we relate the two? Well, we rely on our understanding of uh, shock emissions, okay? uh, which come from uh, the conservation laws of mass, momentum, and energy in the relativistic case. And we find these sort of relations where for the forward shock, uh, you know, we see that the density behind the shock, downstream of the shock is just four gamma, gamma being the Lorentz factor of the material that is moving, uh, times the, the density that was uh, in the uh, upstream, okay, the cold density. So this is a classic stuff. 
which you get even in the non relativistic you get a uh, case that except the gamma there is one. So you have a compression factor by four. Then also you relate the internal energy density of this fluid, hot fluid, to the density that you have behind the, the shock. Same thing, same sort of stuff happens uh, on, on, on this side, okay, where you have, this is the upstream media and this is the downstream media, and they're both, and both of these are hot. Now these equations are not closed equations, so we need other extra, you know, extra conditions to close the whole system of equations. So what we end up assuming, which is a good assumption, and have been shown to be uh, all right in the uh, numerical simulations, is, okay, jumping ahead, but I'll get to that point first, is we assume pressure equilibrium because there's a constant discontinuity between the two shock media. Okay? So both of these are in pressure equilibrium, and we can relate that to their internal energy densities by just knowing their adiabatic indices, which in this case is both lengths because the, the material is optimistically hot. And the other assumption is that both of these are moving at the same speed, the same Lorentz factor. Okay? And I mentioned that the, the forward shock runs ahead of the ejecta, uh, and it goes as root two times the, the, the shock material, so it, it is going slightly faster. And we very well know from from the key what its uh, radial you know, decay profile, how does it slow down given this density profile. Okay. So that sort of determines the dynamics, but, but most of this stuff is done in the asymptotic regimes, where you assume all of these quantities are power law quantities, okay, either constant or power law. But if you really want to do a more self-consistent and a more general treatment where you can have density enhancements and there is no power loss, you know, structure, but you can have ripples outside in your external medium, then you really have to solve a system of equations where you're trying to track, keep track of the energy, how it is changing in those four regions, okay, the, the two shock regions and, uh, uh, well, nothing is changing in the external medium, but the energy uh, is changing in the ejecta that's coming through. So, so it, it is this sort of equation where the constant of motion is the total energy in the system, and but then there is a transfer of energy happening between those three uh, three regions. Okay, and then that amounts to solving this sort of you know uh, one uh, ODE coupled ODEs how gamma is of the system of the shot contact discontinuity how that is changing as a function of radius and how the mass of the ejecta the initial ejecta how it, how that is changing uh, how how much of that mass is changing in the shock region, okay? So which is this? So this is what we tried to do, but before I show you that, there, there are some additional you know, complications in terms of whether the, the shock that goes into the ejecta becomes uh, relativistic or remains non-relativistic, and that changes the dynamics uh, uh, somewhat. So I won't go into, uh, in the interest of time, all, all the details, but when you solve these equations, you get these sort of you know, um, uh, behavior where you're, you're tracking how gamma is changing in these two different, you know, what we call the thick shell, the thin shell regime. In this case, the, the reverse shock is relativistic, so it has this additional phase of energy extraction and slowing down the initial uh, ejecta. And in the, other, in the other scenario where the reverse shock is Newtonian, it doesn't. Uh, and in the end, after most of the energy at this point is transferred, most of the kinetic energy of the initial ejecta is trans transferred to the shock external medium, it settles onto this self-similar profile, which is the blank from the key uh, self-similar profile. So I've chosen these parameters in such a way that they both sort of overlap uh, but, and, and demonstrate the two different regimes. Um, and then you can do this for, because it's a general treatment, you can do it for various density profiles. And you know, I'm showing you the relativistic uh, or the thick shell case for different values of k. As, as I mentioned, k can be between zero and two. So different k values, different types of radial profiles of your external medium do affect the dynamics quite a lot. So that has to be, when you do all the theoretical modeling, what that one has to take, take those into account. Uh, most of the time people stick, people stick to zero and two and don't do the general case because you have to solve these equations to do the general case. Uh, and then also, now what, what happens uh, at, at, the, at the shock front. So these are collisionless uh, shock, so there is no particle collisions happening, but the shock is mediated by electromagnetic forces. Particles are bouncing uh, you know, upstream and downstream due to, uh, from magnetic fluctuations. And uh, there are three important things that happen at these, these collisionless shocks. One is particle acceleration, okay? So let me point you to these two figures where people have done uh, particle cell simulations of a, a relativistic shock propagating into or glass web going into electron ion media, which is uh, the relevant thing here. 
Uh, and then uh, what we're interested in looking at the electron spectrum because they are the radiators, they radiate all the energy. Okay. And this is the spectrum that develops. Most of the energy goes into producing this thermal, thermal bump heat, basically. And there's a small fraction of electrons that get accelerated to high energies into this power up here. Okay. So that's what happens. The other thing that also happens in magnetic field amplification or generation of new magnetic fields due to a viable type of instability. Uh, at least short fronts, okay? So you have some very small seed, you may have some very small seed magnetic field, almost non-existent in the ISM of the order of few microvolts that get, may get amplified, but you also generate new magnetic field. And the combination of the two high energy particles having a magnetic field is we generate synchrotron photons. That's how you put the particles. So these are the things that occur at these collisionless uh, shocks. So this sort of figure shows the development of, uh, the, you know, how strong is the magnetic field? The shock is somewhere here, and this is the upstream area, this is the downstream. So you see uh, there is very small magnetic field here, which gets amplified uh, in the downstream. Okay? And that's where the particles, particle cooling occurs and radiation is generated. Okay, but we don't have an idea, clear idea from first principles how that actually happens. So that's why we end up doing all these you know, particle cell simulations to get an understanding of how much energy the, the energy in the shocked medium, how much of that energy goes into accelerating particles and then eventually into uh, which is meaning what is the efficiency of producing your radiation? Okay. We don't have a clue. We have some some ideas, but exactly what the values are, we don't know. So we hide our ignorance of what's going on in terms of what's called micro shock microphysical parameters, right? Which is basically saying that we have some energy density in the downstream region, okay, let's call it E2. A fraction epsilon P goes into accelerating the photons, all right? A fraction epsilon E goes into accelerating the electrons, and a fraction epsilon B out of the total uh, goes into producing a magnetic field, okay? What are these fractions? We don't know. We look to nature to give us the answers, okay? We have a model, we fit to uh, our model to observations, and we see, okay, if we can constrain these these parameters. And then further on, uh, the, the total electrons that, that were swept up uh, into this shock, a fraction X, uh, Psi E gets accelerated. You, you saw in the previous figure that not all get accelerated into this tail, power lock tail. Okay, so only a small fraction does get accelerated, and that's the one that gives you the synchrotron emission. And then the remaining is double, all right? And the one that does get accelerated to, to non thermal energies, uh, into a power law, has this sort of uh, energy distribution where dn d gamma, their number for unit Lorentz factor, goes as gamma to the minus p. We don't know what p is. We have some understanding of from diffusive shock acceleration that p is a point of 2.2 uh, or somewhere in between 2 and 2. Okay? Uh, and these are the things when we look at observations we try to constrain. We have a fairly good understanding of the emission that is produced when you have a power law distribution of particles. So again, going back to this distribution, the synchrotron emission that we get is this broken power law, okay? Uh, in reality, it is not really a sharply broken power law. This is just a simplistic picture. It's much more uh, smoothly broken. Uh, has these three characteristic breaks, uh, the absorption frequency, the, the, the frequency at which the, the flux density peaks, which is the injection, uh, corresponds to the injection power uh, of your neurons factor of your electrons and the cooling frequency to sub C. This is the frequency that corresponds to uh, the energy at which the particles are cooling at the dynamic. Okay? And there are two different regimes. I, I won't go into all the all the di differences here, but we have a fairly good understanding of uh, how to, once we know the dynamics of the flow, we know the energy density, the pressure and everything, and the distribu particle distributing, we can calculate uh, uh, the synchrotron emission that we see. Okay? But everything again, you know, most of the people, people when they, they, they use this formalism, everything is done in sort of asymptotic, asymptotic regimes, uh, where you know density is again a power law, everything is you know changes as a power law. Uh, so when you have want to do more realistic calculations, you have to go back and understand the dynamics as I showed you earlier, solve those couple of equations, and then tie your radiation model to the dynamics and, and produce a more self-consistent uh, uh, and general general uh, picture. So people use that formalism to understand the emission. Uh, and this is what it looks like uh, from, as I mentioned, there are two shocks. One is the, the forward shock, one is the reverse shock. 
the emission from the forward shock is, is here shown in the, in the dashed lines, and the, the emission from the reverse shock is shown using the dotted line, and you notice they both peak at different energies, okay? Because there's a different intensities between the two media. That's, uh, they're, they're roughly sort of equal in energy densities and pressure, as I mentioned, uh, but their number densities, particle number densities are, are different, and that would give, gives you the difference in behavior where the things peak. So at early times, the, the reverse shock emission, which is shown by here, and this is shown uh, changing over days, 0.67 days to 4.7, so on and so forth. You see that the reverse shock emission earlier on peaks in the optical, then peaks in the radio, and then disappears. And that it disappears because the shock has crossed the ejector. There's no more uh, particles are being accelerated, and it's done. But the forward shock continues to, but there's ample amount of particles to be, to be accelerated and shocked. Okay, so it continues for a long time, years time scale, and it starts to, to peak, it dominates at early times at, at, uh, art, you know, at, at gamma rays, x rays. Okay, then later on, it, the whole thing sort of shifts down to lower and lower frequencies in both cases, um, and then it peaks at radio, optical radio, and so on and so forth. So that's, sort of the, that's how people do, they, they have these observations and they these models and, and try to constrain the shock microphysical parameters and the properties of the external medium. Uh, now, one interesting thing about the re reverse shock emission is because it is the emission is coming from the shock ejector itself, it allows you to probe the properties of the initial ejector, the jet that was launched. Okay. Because we know for, for the forward shock, we know what kind of magnetic fields we have, very small, nothing interesting. But we still don't know what is the composition of the, of the jets itself, because it has strong magnetic fields, ordered magnetic fields, weak magnetic fields. That can be probed by looking at the reverse shock emission here, and particularly by looking at the linear polarization of this, this reverse shock emission. Okay. So I'm showing you an example here where you see this is, this is the light curve. So the reverse, the optical light curve. So the reverse, the, the reverse shock emission peaks, and then it's just at this point, the uh, the reverse shock has crossed the ejector and it's just a fading emission. And then the forward shock emission takes over this part. Okay. So you have this, this, this optical emission. And on top, I'm showing you the polarization, the, the degree of polarization, which is quite high, 30%, and but uh, dilutes down to lower values because the forward shock emission does not produce high polarization. So it dilutes some of the high polarization that is coming from the reverse shock emission. Okay. And then you have this, uh, you can also track how the polarization area changes. And you, all of these things will become important when we talk about the new observation. But that's the, that's the tool we have to, if you want to learn anything about the ejecta, you look at the, the, after, the afterglow coming from the reverse. Okay. So now, okay, before we go to the observation, one quick point, people have been using this very uh, simple and idealized model of a conical jet, which is uniform in, in all of its properties, uniform Lorentz factors, everything is moving at the same speed, uniform in its energy, okay, which looks like, uh, like this. Everything is like a top hat, okay, and has sharp edges. And the observer can be looking at emission coming from this jet somewhere here, let's say. But there's a, there's a prediction when you have, you know, people realize, even before it was actually the effect was seen, people realize when you have such, such a flow, uh, you are supposed to you're supposed to see a, a steepening in the light curve when the observer sees the emission coming from the edges of the jet. Okay. Now, why would that happen? It's because initially, when your your Lorentz factor is high and the jet is not slowed down enough, you are only sampling some small fraction of the solar angle of, of your flow. But as the jet slows down, your Lorentz factor changes. It, it goes down uh, with the radius. And this, the size of the region which is available to you to see grows, okay, by one over again. That's the beaming cone size. And at some point, you will see emission coming from the edge of the jet. And when that happens, you should see a steepening of your light curve by one, one power. Okay, if this is, if this is going at you to the minus, minus uh, one, this will steepen to the minus two. That's what's crazy. And this, this steepening is achromatic, meaning it doesn't matter which uh, which wavelength you're observing in radio, optical, X-ray, gamma rays. They should all show because it is a geometrical effect, not a, not a spectral effect. They should all show this. Thing. Okay, so we have good understanding of the expectation when you have this kind of work. Now let's look at the observations quickly. See in the remaining time I have to see if all this model that I told you how it stacks up to uh, the, the the observation. 
So according to Pan 098, this GRV, the brightest of all time is, I call, you know, people call it the boat, brightest of all time, because this is, this is the brightest GRV we have ever observed in the history of observing GRVs. Okay. And it, is, it was remarkable, spectacular, and all of them broke all sorts of records. Uh, <coughs> so it, it, it was observed as, uh, you know, this is how the GRV naming convention is. It was observed on uh, 9th of October in 2022. And that's, that's how the name goes. Uh, a lot of uh, gamma ray instruments uh, that are running here, they observed this, uh, this burst. Uh, many of them were saturated because it was very bright. Uh, with, with sort of peak, uh, peak flux of you know, this high. Uh, since you don't look at these numbers, and, you know, I have to put that in, this into context. But uh, before I do that, this is, this is the, uh, the light curve observed by, by Fermi GDM, the gamma ray burst monitor on the Fermi uh, telescope. And it, it showed a bunch of uh, high, very bright peaks, uh, after which it, it showed this very smooth behavior, which which signaled that now it is the afterglow emission and before this is the prompt. So the prompt lasted for about 600 seconds. Okay, this is shown in different energy bands from, from the GDM. Um, so broke the record of the peak flux, broke the record of the highest fluence GRV that we've seen, and the redshift for this was 0.151, corresponding to 7.4 megaparsec. So now we have fluence and, and redshift. We can calculate the isotropic equivalent energy that was emitted. And it was the star here. So it is the highest we've ever seen from any GRB. So there's a, there's a sample of GRBs shown. There are a few bright ones, but this is the brightest one. Okay. And if you if you try to compare that to the log and log s distribution uh, to understand how rare this event is. Okay, so this is all the GRBs that we've ever observed over you know over the last 56 years uh, from by different instruments. So if we look at the cumulative per year number of GRBs observed as a function of the, the fluids, okay? You place this object here, somewhere here, and that gives you an idea of how rare this is. So this event, we're, we, we're only supposed to see statistically these sort of bright event once per 10,000 years. So, we're, so, so we've been pretty lucky in and you know, now we'll have to wait another 10,000 years to see something similar. Uh, so this, is, you know, this presents a golden opportunity to learn a whole lot of uh, things that are going on which you don't understand. Uh, not that we understand now, but you know we, we were able to understand some, but still uh, the mystery remains in many of the, uh, the problems. Um, but it's you know these sort of things that that break that uh, you know degeneracies in our understanding, uh, which it did. Okay. So uh, if that wasn't all, uh, you know this was also uh, remarkably the, the one of the brightest in terms of uh, TV gammas. So. Uh, an observatory in China, this large high altitude air shower observatory, LASSO, uh, detected 64,000, this is like unprecedented, 64,000 photons uh, in the TEV range. Okay, this is the observatory here, this is the TEV light curve that they, they saw, overlapping with, with prompt emission, you know, within this, uh, below 600 seconds, and then transitioning into the afterglow that we saw. Here is the, uh, the spectrum that they measured. This is the measured spectrum, this is the intrinsic spectrum. The reason why there's a difference is because there's gamma gamma absorption on route uh, to the high energy gamma rays. These are being absorbed by the CMB and the stars. <laughs> okay, so now let's look at the broadband afterglow, uh, the multi wavelength afterglow from, from the source and compare with what we discussed earlier. Okay, so this is, this is that uh, radio uh, optical and X-ray emission. Now the X-ray emission is mostly and uh, predominantly powered by the forward shock emission. Uh, it is always well sampled, so this is something that we should look at first to see if what it shows. Okay. So it is quite clear <coughs> by these lines that there is a break here coming at around 20 days okay, in the X-ray emission, where this, the the flux density, the light curve steepens uh, by ever so slightly. Okay, and the delta. Delta alpha, the, the index here is only 0.14. Now, what is the expectation from our models? So if you have a you know, classical you know, uh, uh, top hat jet with sharp edges, what do you expect? So in that case, you expect uh, if the jet is not spreading and if it is keeping you know, its shape, uh, in that case, you expect this delta alpha to be of order either between 0.5 or 0.75, much steeper than what we but now this, these two numbers come because for different values of k. But this is the range. 
So you expect it to be rather much steeper than what we observed. Or if it's a spreading jet, then you know you you expect this uh, line curve to go as p to the minus p, where p is your your uh, power law index of your particles, the electrons, which is of order two point two from you know uh, the Fermi mechanism. Right? But we don't see that. So so some you know so something else is going on. It is not the classical stuff that we expect. Is this a spectral change or is it a geometric change? Now there's that question because you see a break. But we also see a break happening here in the optical light. So this sort of signals that it is indeed a geometric change, not a spectral change. Not just affecting the X-rays, but all the other wave frequencies too. So what might be going on? Uh, okay, so let's see. We made those points. Okay. All right, so the next thing you do is whatever tools available that are available to you, uh, the model that we discussed earlier, you apply that and you see what can we learn. Can we actually explain all the emission light curve and spectra? <coughs> and there, because there was a bright, bright GRB, the brightest. Uh, so there were you know various big campaigns. People obtained a lot of data, and everybody was trying to fit with the, the standard models, the standard graphical model that we discussed. Um, and this is what they found. So first, they tried to model uh, the X-rays, okay, and the optical emission with the forward shock emission. So this is the this so it, it does an okay job in fitting the data much better than, uh, than than these ones. These are unexplained. So when this sort of thing happens, you automatically know that there has to be an additional spectral component. It cannot be coming from the forward shot. The only option left is reverse shot. Okay. So this emission has to be reverse shot. So okay, let's model the reverse shot now with what we know already. We try, you know, people try to do that in this work, and it's a rather poor fit. Very poor in this case, but these models have been used for hundreds of other GRPs and have we've really gotten excellent fits. Everything is all well. We can explain the data, uh, you know, brilliantly well, but not here. Okay, so something else is going on, and this very bright GRB is revealing the the flaws or you know, in our assumption and understanding. So when these things didn't work, when when your tools fail, they don't work. Then you're like, well, okay, people like you know. There must be some non-standard physics we haven't got. Something else is going on. Um, or um, then you have to provide reasons of what it might be. So you know, people try to conjecture. So this is people, you know, all these groups that try to model this, they started saying, okay, well, there could be the shock microphysical parameters uh, might be changing over time. Could, could, could be that because we don't have the answer. We don't expect it to, it is not expected that they would change, but who knows if that's what's happening. But the answer came, you know, was, was I think simpler than this, than what people were thinking. Because everybody was scratching their heads like, what's about to do? Why is it not working? And it's failing miserably. Okay. So the answer was that you don't have this con you know, conical jet with sharp edges. You have a much smoother jet with angular structure. Okay? Uh, an energetic core, or, let me point to this example here, you have a co-energetic core, which, which is you know, very much similar to uh, a conical jet, but it is surrounded by wings of material, which is lower energy and also moving slightly slow. Okay, but there is stuff there which can which can provide uh, energy into your line of sight when you actually start sampling it. So there are a lot of details here. Uh, again, I, I will try to save time and not go into uh, too many details. But the idea was, if you assume if the flow is not just just this, the top half, okay, but has these these wings of material uh, with some energy profile, a shallow one, okay, where the energy per unit solid angle declines rather in a, in a shallow manner, okay, shallow compared to the compared to the, the sharp drop in the top half jet, which energy goes to zero. Uh, then you can explain this, okay, and the time scales at which point everything you know the break happens. Uh, works out rather well when you have such a world. It's, it's, it's a simple idea. It's something that we know should happen because when these jets are coming out of the star, they do, there's a lot of interaction going on between the stellar material and the jet material, and they do tend to develop, as numerical simulations have shown, they do tend to develop these structures. So this is, this is not crazy, this is not something new, uh, but now there is very strong evidence that it is there. But, so, you know, this is from, from, from our work. We try to fit the data. X-rays are, uh, uh, are explained rather well with the forward shock emission, but we still had problems 
with, uh, with the reverse optimization because we had a model to, uh, to model the forward shock emission from such a flow with, with angular structure, but we didn't know how to do it properly for the reverse shock emission. That didn't exist at the time. And luckily, I was working on such a model. So sometimes you're at the right place at the right time. Uh, and so the, the, the key things, two things that we're missing is there have, there's no self-consistent modeling, as I described to you earlier, between the, the forward shock and the reverse shock dynamics. And you only get that by solving those two couple of equations and then deriving the radiation from it, okay, which is done uh, in this work. And a uh, few other, other things where you are not just looking at the emission coming from along your line of sight, but there's also emission coming from other parts of the flow, which is delayed by some time. And do, that emission is not generally modeled in analytical models. They only look at emission coming along your line of sight but not from other angles away from, from your line of sight, which does contribute. So the code that uh, we generated does all that, takes into account all these effects. So when you couple the dynamics uh, and the afterglow coming from those, <clears throat> well, you, you find a remarkably good, not a perfect, but a remarkably good fit. The reason why it's not perfect is because I think there are like 17 parameters, okay, which are kind of constrained. Some of these are, we have good grasp on some, most we don't. And when I was doing this, uh, I was doing everything by hand. There was no MCMC that I used. Being a theorist, sometimes we, we don't do, do all those things. So I was turning the knob on slowly and everything, and then letting it evolve and, you know, and, and producing all this, trying to do the fit, see if it, and the fit is not done by any sort of uh, error analysis. This is basically, you know, when I wrote the word fit in the paper, the referee is like, this is not a fit. You can call it a comparison at best, but this is not a fit. This is not how we fit stuff model to date. So mm -hmm. that's fine. I use the word comparison. Uh, I should have used it comparison, but it wasn't fitting in the whole thing. So, <laughs> okay. so uh, but you know, the point is that we, ex we explain the, the X-rays really well. We explain the radio data, which uh, the other models, uh, the, the standard models failed to explain. We explain the light curves and everything rather well. Okay. Um, and the interesting thing, one thing that I pointed out we found is uh, one of the parameters, which was very hard to, to sort of find any other value for, was the particle acceleration the parameter, the, the fraction of electrons that get accelerated to uh, this power law distribution, which particle and cell simulations find of order of 1%. Out of all the total electrons that come in, only 1% get accelerated. And we find similar results. So this is that Xi E parameter. So we also find 1%, and it was very hard to not get this 1% or get larger than it was hard. So it's telling us something very interesting. And it, it does agree with the particle cell simulations. Okay. Uh, this is sort of this is the uh, uh, the energy structure that we use, uh, <laughs> has a core and then it sort of softly breaks into this uh, power of wings. Okay. And now the question that, that comes out of this is that how do you actually produce it by in, in numerical simulation? We do see, we do see, you know, similar structures, but not similarly shallow, slightly sharper structure or steeper structure here. So now the, now the big question is, well, how do you actually get something like this uh, in simulations, okay, when the jet is coming out of the star? What what gives you that? So that's that's an open question at this point. Okay, let this let me take the next five or so minutes to discuss the last uh, topic, which is another uh, very nice observation that we obtained that tells you something uh, remarkable about the magnetic field in these jets, okay? Uh, so this is another GRP, not as bright as the one that we discussed, but still pretty pretty bright in terms of the, uh, the energy budget in gamma rays that are emitted, uh, you know, fairly high. <coughs> and, and this is the, uh, this is the light curve. Um, but we have the light, light curve, optical, uh, X-rays, uh, and GB, uh, gamma rays from Fermi. So immediately when you see such a thing, there's a, there's a rapid fading in the optical that's happening. There is, there's nothing else that gives you that. It has to be the reverse shock image. Okay? So that was quite clear from, from the get-go. So we had reverse, reverse shock emission earlier on, but then transitioned into the forward shock emission when the reverse shock becomes, uh, fades away. Okay? Um, and and the interesting thing that happened here is that we have these very high energy gamma rays, which shows the same trend of decline as the as the uh, the optical emission. And we we tried our modeling uh, 
nothing worked you will see in terms of you know this emission coming from the forward shell uh the only thing and i'm, I'm not going into i don't have uh, i don't have the slides prepared here but uh we explained that emission has a single control self component inverse component emission with seed optical photons which is something uh people have had seen uh hints of in previous works but this was the definitive uh sort of signature here which were, we were able to explain as what's called ssc see? Synchrotron self confirmation. So that was one of the novelty uh, of this paper uh, to get into to nature astronomy. But the I guess the uh, the hero of the paper is the, the polarization. Uh, so polarization was taken, you know, the optical data, the polarization was taken by this Kanata 1.5 meter telescope in, in Japan. Uh, this is the again the same light curve, optical light curve. We show the uh, the, the light. The, the flux from the field stars. And this is uh, the polarization. Uh, this shows the polarization degree, starting fairly high, fairly high in the sense that it's much higher than what you expect from afterglow, uh, from the forward shock afterglow. Uh, so this is like starting at about six or so percent, declines as the reverse shock emission fades away and the forward shock emission starts to dominate. And we expect only a few percent for the forward shock emission. So it dilutes the polarization. It goes through this sort of chaotic phase in the middle and then you know, completely almost dies down the polarization of order of few percent, which is what we expect. And we've seen in many other journeys. Uh, same thing, you know, interesting things are happening with the polarization angle. It stays rather uh, steady here. So let me, let me a, ah, okay. So on average, the polarization angle remains steady, which tells us something very interesting of what's going on. The only way it can stay steady is when you have ordered fields in it, okay? And no random sort of stuff happening. And then this is happening during the reverse shock afterglow. Uh, but when the forward shock takes over, there's a change in 90 degrees. And this is something remarkable we have not seen, and it, and it will make, make sense in, on the next slide of what it is. Okay? So how do we get large polarization? Well, we go back to our Rybicki enlightenment, what we've learned for, in our astronomy courses. You have a magnetic field, particles are gyrating and they're emitting synchrotron photons. It is always linearly polarized. Uh, and you know, you see this projected emission on the plane of the sky. Uh, if you have this flux density going as moving to minus alpha, for example, then your polarization degree is related to this alpha. Okay, uh, and this this is this can be if you have a ordered field can be as high as fifty percent, high as seventy five percent, and low as as low as fifty percent. We didn't see that. We saw six percent. So that means there 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 has to be another magnetic field component which has to dilute the polarization degree because it was all completely ordered. Then you would expect very high degrees of polarization, which we didn't see. And the other very critical thing, critical point here is. That the polarization vector, its alignment on the, on, on the plane of the sky, is n cross b, n being the direction of your photon, b is the, the direction of the magnetic field, which is this is true in any field, okay, where whatever you see it. So this forms like a like a triad. So it's like you know, if I if I change the direction of a magnetic field by 90 degrees, the polarization direction must also change by 90 degrees. Okay, it's just like a right hand rule. Okay. So this is this is almost my last one. Um, so then, how do you explain that? Well, the model that we put forward to explain the polarization degree and the change of this ninety degrees uh, between the two shocked emission, the reverse shock dominated and the forward shock dominated, is because the reverse shock emission is coming from a ejector, okay, and such ejecta are launched by jets, and we know uh, jets, you know, can be launched as if you have the black fridge light mechanism, you need to have strong ordered magnetic fields such as these. So it is possible that the ejecta has these helical magnetic fields. Okay, These are ordered on large, much larger scales, as you can see. Well, scale compared to the, the region that we observe on, on, on the surface of the flow. Because everything is so highly beamed, we only see a small fraction of it. And compared to that, these, these fields are much, much more ordered. So that can give you a high uh, polarization degree. Later on, when the emission is dominated by the forward shock, it is coming from the, the shocked uh, external medium. Okay? And because you're producing magnetic fields, which are small scale, you know, via this uh, vital filamentation instability, these are uh, of the order of the particles, you know, skin depth fields. They can be much more random and, and, and unordered. And you expect 
you know, this sort of, so it, it's been hard to see, but I plotted polarization vectors uh, that you expect, you know, sort of ran, you know, orientations, uh, which are uh, rather symmetric around your line of sight. So if there was no emiss emissivity gradient, or if the flow was uniform, then from such a flow, uh, you would get zero polarization because everything would cancel out in, in this scenario. So you need to have some sort of, uh, some sort of structure. And we saw in the earlier GRB that there has to be structure. So we've done, we've done the same thing here. If you have structure, it breaks symmetry and you can get a small level of polarization, which we saw of order of 3% in the later part of the, uh, when, when it is dominated by uh, the forward shock. Earlier, it is dominated by the, uh, the ordered field, and you get much larger, more aligned polarization vectors and higher de uh, degree. But the critical point here is, that's why I explained to you the right-hand rule, is this is in the, in the plane transverse to where the shock is going, the ejector is going, okay? It is, tr it is transverse. This here, now we have to change we have to change the orientation of the polarization angle by 90 degrees, which means we have to change the magnetic field by 90 degrees. How do we do that? Well, blanford McKee theory tells you that the stuff that gets shot downstream gets stretched radially. This, that's, that's the model, blanford McKee model, and the, the fluid elements get stretched radially behind the shock. And so will the magnetic field. So if you compare the orientation, this is transverse to the direction of motion. This is along radially to the direction of motion. There's a difference in 90 degrees. So this model explains the polarization degree, high polarization degree to low, and the change in the polarization angle by 90 degrees, which has never, which has, we, first of all, we never had such observations to actually make such a connection, but now we do. And it tells you something very interesting about the, the structure of the field in the eject. So, so my conclusions, there are many, but uh, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be brief, that now there is undeniable evidence uh, that we have, uh, the jets have angular structure, and they're not just simple top hat jets, okay? So we have to be careful. We can, that model still works fine for many GRVs because they are not bright enough to, to probe uh, that angular structure. So it is sufficient to keep on using these, but when you have such bright events, you do have to change your model, okay? Um, and many of the works that you know, sometimes claim changing shock microphysical parameters, they really have to do such consistent modeling uh, before, before claiming such a thing, because we have other tools available which we have to rule out first in order to invoke such a thing. Okay, so one has to be careful of that. Small particle acceleration, as I mentioned earlier, 1% of particle, which you know, um, stands true in the modeling that, that, that we did. Um, we found, you know, the GEV uh, after blue emission could be coming from the reverse shock as synchrotron of Compton emission, it was Compton emission, which, had, which wasn't seen before. Uh, and then the high linear polarization that we see from the reverse shock emission can be explained by having an ordered magnetic field in the ejecta. Finally, these are some of the outstanding questions. Uh, I will point out only one. This is for, you know, students and postdocs uh, to, to start working on. Uh, one, one interesting thing is uh, we saw a very shallow break in the, the light curve. That is not the only uh, event that we have. There are a few others that do show such shallow behavior. So we expect to see this uh, sort of decline in the light curve, but we don't see it. Um, so it is telling us something, but we do see it in many other, other cases. So is there is there something interesting going on in these very energetic and bright GRPs that is not happening in the, uh, the weaker ones. So that remains still remain an open question. And modeling like this, which I showed today, can uh, answer such things. I will stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramadi. We will start with questions in the auditorium. Ricardo? Uh, there is, <clears throat> sorry, there is any effect of the metallicity of the interstellar, interstellar medium on the so in in these yeah in these calculations we don't treat it as uh, uh, metals. Everything is it's sort of uh, we we care about the dynamics which is just mass. So we have ions, let's say, in the, in the external medium, and they are just you know a bunch of protons. It's just they're just contributing mass to the to change the dynamics. So how much mass is there? We care about only the, the profile. 
But metallicity, we don't care about for this morning. We do care about uh, for observations, um, for like optical observations or maybe infrared observation in terms of how much dust is there on the, on the way. Sometimes we don't see, uh, <clears throat> we see dark GRBs, uh, we don't see the prompt emission, uh, but we, we may see the afterglow. So what happened to that, right? So then you have to worry about what is in the path of, of the emission. Is there a metallicity dust and all those things that could be absorbing some of it? Okay. Is there any gravitational wave counterpart of the brightest gamma ray force that was detected? Uh, so for this, yeah, so this one there, we, because it's it's coming from the collapse of a star, uh, people, although people do, do studies of, you know, because it, we have a rapidly spinning object, it could generate gravitational waves, but rather weakly compared to the one when you have large masses orbiting. Uh, we have never detected such a thing. Uh, but of course, but from, from the two binary star versions, we did indeed. Is the redshift of the URB taken from the host galaxy or how it is emission? Yeah, so so we look at all the you know, line of absorption and all spectrum. You know, you look at the, you have to first localize it, which was initially very hard, but now we have things, and, and the afterglow is key to that. You cannot localize things with just the, the prompt emission because they're just gamma rays and they're, they're very hard to localize. So you need other things like the optical emission. Uh, and then you find it. Let's see that you take the spectrum of the galaxy and like how you relate to the uh, the energy. Okay. So that's for this. Okay. So I, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, the energy of these guys of the of the single star uh, gamma ray burst uh, are about uh, to the yeah, but uh, in your histogram, uh, you showed something something that are even more energetic than to the fifty four or something. Yeah, so there is some distribution here. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but that cannot be from a single source, can it? It, it can. You can. So uh, it is a supernova explosion has to the fifty one, but not yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So um, the reason why that is is because those energies are what's called isotropic equivalent, meaning. When we look at the flux, we measure the flux density and we know the distance, then we say, okay, well, we you know we see this much energy. But we, what we've done is we've we spread that energy over four pi star radians. But it's not, because all of that energy is actually coming from a jet, meaning it is not spread out over four pi. And now you need to take a factor of delta omega, the solid angle of the flow, okay, divide by four pi the ratio, which is less than one, because the jet has a solid angle well, much smaller, it's you know it's it's like five degrees that's sort of the opening angle of the jet. So now you reduce those things, the true energy, which you're concerned with, the true energy is uh, two to three orders of magnitude lower than the isotropic equivalent value. So you're right, how do you actually produce such energy to load you don't? Because that is not the true energy, that is just the measured energy which you associate with an isotropic equivalent energy. Right. Okay. Any other questions, Bill? With this time scale of 10,000 years, does it come from extrapolating from? So, could that extrapolation be wrong? Because it sounds too good to be true. True, true, yeah, exactly. So, so all you know, people have done is look at, well, let's go back a little bit, is look at that extrapolation, exactly. So, and, and we don't have events, uh, the, the, the tail, yeah. so the tail cuts off at, you know, Tens of below 10 to the minus two, we don't have anything here. So we don't know, maybe it just falls off. So this is indeed an extrapolation. And based on that, yes. So may, may, this is an optimist, you know, or, or a, a number which is probably much larger, maybe it's thousand years. I don't know. But yes, but still that's a it's still a big, big long time. <laughs> Another? So and how do you produce a single a jet from single object such as that has a core collapse? I mean, so, if you have a risk, I can understand. Yeah, so in both cases, you need to produce a compact object, either a neutron star or, or a black hole, which has to be spinning very fast, mm -hmm. okay? And then you have the gas that is accreting onto this rapidly spinning source, which launches jet. How do the dead jets are launched? We think in the Blackford's and I, nobody has a clear idea. Okay, people are so you, have, you are supposed to have a planet. You need to have a, a, a rapidly rotating compact source and an accreting one. To, to launch it. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions on Zoom?
If not, I have one question. So you mentioned that you haven't done NCMC yet. Are there plans to, or has somebody already started doing it? Yeah, yeah. So there are so well, nobody started it. Uh, maybe some students should take take this up. Uh, I, I'd be glad to help. Yeah, yeah, and that, that would be actually pretty good because in the on the last slide when I mentioned we have uh, five or six such objects that don't show such sleep seepening in light curve. All you need to do is get the you know use the same model and apply to those and see uh, if. When you can spin the parameters are the same as what we find in this bright object. That would be something interesting. Yes. Okay. One last question, maybe the auditory. Okay, if not, let's start from the police. See you all next week. <laughs>